Everybody loves banter. <laughs> I I don't know. I've heard otherwise. Who said otherwise? <sighs> Your mom. I don't know. Fucking mom. She doesn't even listen. Don't Hi, you, mom. mom. <laughs> R- uh, Ryan's mom. You talk too much in the beginning. Get to it. We haven't done one of these for a while. Well, I mean, we I, we we put one up that we did in a, a while ago. And so it seems like we haven't done... Anyway, it's confusing. We, together, right now, like talking to each other, haven't done one in a while. But I posted one recently, so it may seem, if you're just like listening to us, be like, no, you did one just last time. Yeah. You gotta read the descriptions, people. Alright. Nobody's gonna do that. What? Lots of care goes into the descriptions. Editing, peer review... The works. All right. Uh, I am Ryan. Expect to be ravaged, McKenna. Oh my God! I, there are more expectations than I even knew. Oh. Yeah. I'm Harland X E A twelve Grant. What? <laughs> Didn't you hear the big news? No. Your buddy Elon had another baby today. And he named it like X dash A E really X twelve or something. Wow! <laughs> All I know is he's sell he's selling his mansions, and I'm buying. <laughs> that sounds like a place. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're we're the Doddlers, and this is Doddlers Philosophy Podcast, and the pressure is on. The Toddler's Philosophy is an amateur introduction of two dudes in a basement with no association, affiliation, cooperation, or combination with any other entities, primate or otherwise. The views expressed may or may not have merit, and the listeners are encouraged to argue amongst themselves. If you wish to express appreciation for the endeavors undertaken, please visit patreon.com slash philosophy to support the show. Send an email to philosophy at gmail.com or rate and review on Apple Podcasts. For updates and downtakes, follow on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or subscribe on your favorite podcast application. talking about one of my favorite books tonight and I tried to do it some justice but it'll probably be a mess but the book in question is Richard Rorty's Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature from 1979 and it's pretty awesome but it's 400 pages of dense ass philosophy that we're gonna try to talk about in approximately two hours verbally Sounds like a recipe for success. <laughs> yeah. I have. I would have something interesting to say, but I don't. Continue! <clears throat> Plus bourbon. So, uh, the, uh, for codification purposes, Richard Rorty was an American philosopher typically qualified under the term pragmatism these days. Uh, he was alive in 1931, 2007! Went to school at University of Chicago and Yale, and then taught primarily at Princeton and Stanford and some other places. I liked this quote that Wikipedia attributed to Jürgen Habermas in his obituary, <laughs> where, and where he wrote, Nothing is sacred to Rorty the Ironist, which is another term that apparently Rorty invented to refer to his own philosophy. Uh-huh. Asked at the end of his life about the holy, the strict atheist answered with words reminiscent of the young Hegel. My sense of the holy is bound up with the hope that someday my remote descendants will live in a global civilization in which love is pretty much the only law. Mm. Must have been during the California days. (laughs) Must have been. (laughs) Um, One of the reasons that I really like what I have read of Rorty is that he strikes me as a genuine idea guy. The sort of people 
that we'd like to talk about on the Dawdlers don't have obvious agendas. They like to read, write, think, and talk, and they say interesting things. So we're going to try to say something about what he had to say. <sighs> By we, we mean Harley. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you've got to come up with all... You have to be the everyman, the audience, oh, and yeah. ask questions about all this stuff, because there's going to be so much. You should have printed off these notes so I could have... Whatever. Anyway. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> Among the things we're going to talk about today in a little TLDR thing, we're going to talk about normal versus revolutionary discourse, which I think we did previously on the Doddlers from yeah. Kuhn. We're going to talk about some Rorty terms, systematic versus edifying philosophy. And we're going to talk about Rorty's version of a couple of terms you may have heard elsewhere, epistemology versus hermeneutics. He has a very particular notion of what those two things are. Um, he goes, okay, well, here's the conceit for this episode to try to help us a little bit. Excellent. We are going to be extremely, perhaps irresponsibly dichotomous. There's going to be good guys and bad guys. There's going to be a list of concepts that we want to get rid of and ones that we want to promote. And th so there's going to be a black and white thing that I overlay on this. Okay. Just to assist a little bit. Because Rorty has a huge list that he wants us to transcend, abandon, etc. Not replace, and that is important and we'll get to that later. He doesn't want to put something in in their stead, but he wants us to abandon these, move beyond them, develop some sort of conceptual scheme, though I think he's an anti-conceptual scheme too. He's no <laughs> to substitutionist. Yeah. So he wants to get rid of the mind-body problem, Theories of Reference, Correspondence Truth, Episode 4. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Spirit versus Nature Distinction, or as the philosophers uh, do it, the whole uh, Geisteswissenschaften versus Naturwissenschaften, you know, the, the two cultures, the oh. in academia, okay, the yeah. sciences, humanities. Right, okay. Uh, subjective, objective, mental, physical, anything that's eternal, uh, rationality and objectivity, essentialism, a priori, like all this stuff is going. It's gotta oh, go. You're right. Analytic synthetic distinction, facts, privilege, boom. These things gotta go. What do we want instead? He wants to have a whole bunch of holism, pragmatism, edification, coping mechanisms, which is another term of art in Rorty philosophy, Wittgensteinian language games, coherence, truth, conditionality, sociality, conversation. We want to promote these things. Toto ratio. So now you know everything and we don't have to go through any further. Right? All right, good. Uh, and then here's the outro song. We already wrote in the preface of Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Yes. Almost as soon as I began to study philosophy, I was impressed by the way in which philosophical problems appeared, disappeared, or changed shape as a result of new assumptions or vocabularies. A philosophical problem was a product of unconscious adoption of assumptions built into the vocabulary in which the problem was stated. Assumptions which were to be questioned before the problem itself was to be taken seriously. Getting back to these assumptions, making clear that they are optional, I believed, would be therapeutic. So that ought remind us of episode 14 or whatever it was and our buddy Wittgenstein mm -hmm. and the whole, you know, we don't want to solve philosophical problems but dissolve them. We want, mm. we want to do some therapy on these philosophers and say, just chill out, buddy. Like, uh -huh. we don't, you don't need to worry about that so much. Okay. So, Wittgenstein is on the good guys team uh -huh. for Rorty. Along with people like Wilfred Sellers and Willard Quine and Charles Peirce and John Dewey, Heidegger, Nietzsche, James, Kuhn, Feyerabend, etc. Okay. And the bad guys is the, I don't know, is it the Enlightenment people? A Ooh, little shit. bit of Plato, or at least Platonism, what has been done with Plato subsequently, and Aristotle, he's with Korzybski, and we're going to get rid of some Aristotle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then primarily the trio of Descartes, Locke, and Kant. 
in the 16th, 17th century area. Okay. It's like they set us, set philosophy on a path, and it might not be the best one. So everything that you need is in the title, and then we just have to spell everything out. Philosophy, mirror, nature. What are those things? The Descartes, Locke, Kant, the, you see, the, we don't have a good way to, to turn that into a morpheme, right? The LDK, the DLK, the cold, the, you know, it doesn't make a night, you can't say it out loud yeah, quickly. Yeah. Can we say villains, heroes? The villains think that philosophy is kind of this special domain whose job it is to oversee whoa, 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 whoa. the rest of intellectual culture. They see themselves as this adjudicator of claims made by religion, science, politics, whatever. You know, they're this overseer. And that reminds me of another previous episode. I think is all the way back to number three. Yeah, yeah, episode three, even though we have an episode zero. <laughs> <laughs> Where we on the dot, and this is a theme that we've talked about on a bunch of different episodes, that we have this little thing. I think we can attribute Ryan as the first author of this. The uh, equilateral plane triangle <laughs> of game players, truth seekers, and overseers. And that plays in a lot, I think, to an interpretation of Rory, what Rorty is saying in here. He thinks that philosophers saw themselves primarily as overseers, and I think it would be fair to say that he wants to just collapse it, collapse the triangle down to a line and say there's only game players and truth seekers and let's all be game players. Ah, okay. So he wants to remove a little bit of the inflated ego of philosophers to think that anyone has a right to be an overseer of the rest of culture. And he's, you're just playing games, language games, like anybody else. Uh-oh. And clearly nobody thinks we can get at truth anymore. He is a bit of a satirist rather than an arguer in much of this. Sure. So that instead of laying out his premises and conclusion as to why you ought not believe in truth, he will just say, well, if you believed in truth, you'd be doing something like this. And nobody thinks that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, and we'll get to the examples. All right. The villain's conception of philosophy is as overseers, and Rorty wants to undermine that. Yes. The mirror is what he refers over and over to as our glassy essence, which comes from a Shakespeare quote, which I'm about to read because it's kind of cute. And it's the myth or conception that the nature of being human includes that we have a faculty, going back to the whole Kant picture again, of rationality somehow in here, and that the job of philosophy is to somehow grasp, represent, reflect reality or the world or whatever internally so that we have this glassy essence, this mirror inside and epistemology's job is to kind of polish the mirror and make sure that it accurately reflects what is out there. Gotcha. Shakespeare wrote you know, what are these fucking philosophers? They're like, watch me do a dramatic reading of Shakespeare. <laughs> do it. But man, proud man dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as to make angels weep, who with our spleens would all laugh themselves mortal. And I like that in many different ways. It ties <laughs> together all kinds of stuff. Yeah. My co-host has spleen issues before, right? That's right. <laughs> I've had a lot of Now, we talk spleen. about apes all the time. And, you know. Jesus Christ. It's just as if it was meant for us. It, it was meant for us. And then uh, the nature part is just the assumption, again, that he diagnoses as developing as the result of a particular language game. But it's the conception that there is such a thing as a fixed, eternal, objective reality outside of us that then our job is to reflect. So those are the, th the three elements that make up this picture from Descartes, Locke, Kant that Rorty wants to shatter. Mm. 
shatter that mirror. How much does that make sense? I mean, I've got a lot of things going on in my head. Um, I think I, I understand the, the, you know, the visual metaphor or whatever of the mirror being inside and whatever's outside then reflects and we then have some access to, if not the thing itself, then to some uh, internal processing of what's outside. And that would be the mirror's reflection. And again, philosophers, like you said, have to go around polishing it for the epistemological reasons that we need a clearer picture, a clearer and clearer picture. And that's that, that makes sense to me. I don't know if I'm... Am I getting it, would you say? Yep, or, sounds okay. right. All right, so then uh, the idea that he wants to break down your preferred geometric form of this, <laughs> what did you call it, a quadrilateral plane or something? You called oh, it an equilateral, equilateral triangle or flat plane yeah. or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Ah. Um, that, uh, you know, you want to collapse, you want to basically get rid of one of the points. And just have a line between truth seeking and game playing. I don't know how far I'm supposed to deviate, <laughs> you know, but when you say he wants to get rid of overseeing, you in the past have identified <laughs> yourself more in terms of committing overseeing behaviors. So, how do you Indeed. feel when you get that sense from Rorty when he's like, got that shit out, Harland? Are you like, don't! This is my thing. I want to oversee. Like Korjibsky, perhaps, even. He seems like a bit of an overseeing kind of thing. Even the idea of we need to throw away something or abandon it seems a little bit almost overseeing-like in that there's a governing quality to it. Mm -hmm. So what's the, uh, what's the deal there? That's one of the reasons that I like Rorty and like this book is that I'm not entirely sure where I fit in or disagree with it. Because many of the things... I also look at his villains as villains. Okay. I also want to transcend, abandon, replace, do something with almost all the concepts he wants to abandon. But he does say a couple of things that do disagree with me. I think, or sound like they do at first, and I think some more of them are spelled out here. See when I read some of this if you think this also sounds like me. I have argued that the desire for a theory of knowledge is a desire for constraint, a desire to find foundations to which one might cling, frameworks beyond which one must not stray. Objects which impose themselves and representations which cannot be gainsaid. I would rather like to show us how things look when we give up the desire for confrontation and constraint and hope that the cultural space left by the demise of epistemology will not be filled, that our culture should instead become one in which the demand for constraint and confrontation is no longer felt. This is not the quote I was thinking. <laughs> Editing! Can I, inter can I interrupt? Yes. I guess I want to quickly do a thing with this uh, equilateral triangle. We're just going to use the three, although I'm, there's four. Uh, but the three kinds of behaviors that you were talking about. Overseeing, truth-seeking, and gameplay. So, and I want to use it maybe in the context of the mirror metaphor or whatever. So, to my thinking, one who's endeavoring to do truth-seeking would see the reflection as um you know ever you know getting ever close to being able to really understand and access and sink one's teeth into the truth the view from nowhere the the thing whatever it is even if it's just virtual and it isn't actual it's something and it gives them some peace inside or whatever and then potentially then overseeing is well, I'll leave overseeing for last. Then game playing is just the attempt to kind of make adjustments here and there to, you know, reflections and mirrors and playing around with the whole thing. Maybe to some extent doing some kind of polishing on the mirror, but overall, in general, just making little adjustments. Um, you know, kind of saying, well, I think it really reflects better this way or it reflects better that way. Re without care to whether or not it's reflecting something that we want to point and say is the truth. Then... 
overseeing would be something like, I don't know, uh, you know, like maybe more of the discussion around the adjustments, A, of the mirror, and B, whether or not the polishing really is doing a good job of giving us the reflection for the truth-seeking uh, <laughs> members of our little holy trinity. Uh, so that's kind of one thing I just wanted to say. Maybe give that some context in the... Well, except that Rorty wants us to abandon that entire metaphor. But you can import it into any different point on that triangle, and it'll kind of make sense. Try any like, make you it could make do sense, the yeah. game-playing thing of, I'm going to tilt the mirror this way and that, or see if I can get a second one to set it up and make some kind of... It's for the listeners to understand the, the kind of behaviors those things do. You know, that's all it is. Whether or not the mirror should be there, or the whole enterprise of that structure, or that framing should even exist, according to Rorty or anyone. Just what would a truth-seeking person, or someone committing truth-seeking behavior do? What would somebody do with game-playing behavior do? How would they, you know, it's like how would they approach this system? You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of, you know, what would the motivations be and all that kind of stuff. Game-playing would be let's just have some fun screwing around, seeing what happens when we, you know, make a little tweak to this knob or whatever. Truth-seeking motivations would be, well, we're trying to get a reflection of reality so that we can harness the power of blah, 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 blah. And then overseeing would be like whether or not we're doing this correctly or not. You know, that kind of thing. Like whether or not it's fruitful or efficacious to move the uh, mirror this way. Or That's kind of... I was thinking that when I when I was hearing you say that and uh, about the mirror metaphor and then talking about overseeing and your ideas with respect to Rorty, wanting to collapse it down to a line mm -hmm. between truth-seeking and gameplay. Let's see if this addresses that at all. I know that at least Descartes and Locke used analogies to, like, wax, right? That there's, like, uh, you write an epistle, and then you drip a little candle wax on it, and you have your little seal, and you push it down into this malleable form, and then it hardens, and then it has an impression yeah. that in this wax. And I think that for a time at least, that was how people conceived of learning something or getting some knowledge. That the world is the stamp and the mirror or the mind is this wax and that you want to have uh, these impressions made upon your mind by the world and then you have a clear and distinct idea in the mind or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I mean, you can also get some a priori perhaps. But the world can make them, you can derive them from pure reason, perhaps, or something. And that maybe the overseer-style philosopher's job would be the whole, like, view from nowhere thing of saying, okay, well, I'm standing out here on the peninsula, and I can view both. I can look at your stamp in the wax, and I can look at the world, and I can compare the two to see if you have successfully imported the world, the knowledge, into your mind. And I think, and Rorty's saying that is an absurd thing to expect anyone to be able to do. To be able to have a, a third person objective point of view and know the world and know your mind and then match them up. And that's what he's calling epistemology, though that's a particular definition to him. But he just calls that whole enterprise epistemology and says, we can't do that. All we can do is kind of talk to each other. About like, well, you know, uh, what, what does your wax look like? Well, it's kind of pointy and round on the bottom, and it's got this. And then we can talk to each other, and he just wants to start a conversation and keep a conversation going. Having thoughts, but I don't... <laughs> I don't want to... Let's keep, keep on with Rorty. Maybe I'll remember for later. He writes of the, the villains. Okay. They usually think of their discipline as one which discusses perennial eternal problems. The villains see philosophy as foundational to the rest of culture because culture is just the assemblage of claims to knowledge, and philosophy adjudicates these claims. To know is to represent accurately what is outside the mind, and philosophy then came for intellectuals, a substitute for religion. 
The picture which holds traditional philosophy captive is one of the mind as a great mirror containing various representations, some accurate, some not, capable of being studied by pure non-empirical methods. So that's, I guess, the Rorty version of what I was just trying to say, if that helps in any way. Well, pure non-empirical methods, is that like consciousness people, or what's that all about? That's the armchair. Okay. That's that you can just sit back mm -hmm. and contemplate right. and answer some of these questions. Armchair philosophy. He wants, what do, what do we do instead, or whatever, yeah. So the Rorty version, I think, goes more like this. He wants to instead have a notion of philosophy, well, he writes, The notion of philosophy as having foundations is mistaken. Philosophy is not a name for a discipline which confronts permanent issues. It is a cultural genre, a voice in the conversation of mankind. And philosophical progress, quote-unquote, occurs not when a new way is found to deal with an old problem, but when a new set of problems emerges and old ones fade away. And that, again, sounds very Wittgensteinian to me, and undermining, and, you know, it's like you have all these pretensions to what you really are capable of doing philosophy, but you're just uh, another type of conversation. You could sit in this cafe and listen to the beat poets, or you can go over to this one and you can have a political rally, or you can go to this one and listen to a philosophical debate. But they're all just genres of human conversation, and that's the only difference that matters. Okay. I mean, I get it. Uh, I'd love to see what people think of that thought at this point in history, but just because I want to troll. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that can be your homework assignment, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'll have to do a little um, survey, you know, made up of that kind of rarity type stuff, which will make people's, like, chimp come out and be like, Oh, fuck it! Oh, ah. So, all right, if that, what we've just done, is the end of the intro, <laughs> then we'll start, and part one of the three parts Ooh, will be yeah. the last part. And then we'll talk about how he got there. So the first thing that I was going to read is that thing that I accidentally just did about how, oh. you know, you desire this theory of knowledge and it's a constraint. You want confrontation and constraint okay. is this old view. And this, the title of the chapter is From Epistemology to Hermeneutics. And those words mean different things, I think, in the Rorty than they do to us walking in the door. And what he means by epistemology is... Most philosophers claim to have gone beyond epistemology. They, they have agreed that philosophy is a discipline which takes as its study formal or structural aspects of our beliefs. And that by examining these, a philosopher serves the cultural function of keeping other disciplines honest of limiting their claims to what can be properly grounded. Epistemologically grounded. Uh -huh. The dominating metaphor is to think that to understand how to know better is to understand how to improve the activity of a quasi-visual faculty, the mirror of nature, thus to think of knowledge as an assemblage of accurate representations. That's what he's calling the the language game, the job, the cultural form of epistemology. They're digging around in there to study the formal structural aspects of human belief and see if this visual metaphor thing, if they're mirroring nature properly. Okay. I, I want to break it down in my way, but I, I don't want to, like, slow us down. Can I break it down? Yeah. So when I think about... The overseeing view of, of truth-seeking and game-playing, it's kind of like, um, and you've not liked these terms before, but I'll put them out there anyway. The, the idea of you know, evaluating this mirror as an aggregate of 
things the way they actually are, whatever it is, is like external validation. It's a comparison of your model to the world. And, and science will have some kind of model, and usually it's going to just draw a straight, you know, it's going to draw a line. And, you know, how far are the points scattered around it or whatever. The points would be, you know, reality or whatever, the data. And then in this comparison here. Mm -hmm. And then the line just represents the plot of what the model output is. But then when the overseeing person looks at a game player, they might actually use something more like internal validation to see, like, is the model put together well? You know, that kind of thing. And so it seems to me like this is all very external validation oriented toward his epistemology stuff. And you obviously have a lot more to say, so maybe that'll become clear to me what's going on. But that's just my initial trigger is that he's essentially talking about comparing the model to the world or whatever. It seems to me. And so his this primarily so far is with the villains, he's saying truth seeking be gone. Like stop external validation or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he means in the other, when he talks about his heroes, yet. But, I don't even know if any of that made sense. If I'm like, yeah, derailing, and you know how like the track, you know, the wheels come off the tracks, and they start plowing through the sage, and the dust and everything. I think it makes sense, if I'm correct about both you and Rority, I would say that I think he would say, sure, but it's not far enough, that you have to abandon even the, your little dots that you make your line of best fit based on or whatever. No, that's the, that's the external world, so that's what he's saying, abandon, is even just taking your model and comparing it to the dots or whatever. Or at least the move where you say, okay, these dots mean the world, or whatever. They're, well, what do you mean? They're just dots. They're, they mean however you acquired them, maybe. Maybe he... Well, and I don't know if where I'm importing my own self versus what Rorty would say. But I go to a sort of instrumentalist, operationalist route there and say, yeah, you draw this line and it fits best between your dots and you have your mathematical formula for deriving your line of best fit based on your data, but where did the data come from? Is the data the world, or is the data the result of a certain set of experiments that you could spell out and write down your methodology? And you're like, yeah, 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 what, yeah, yeah. So as long as we're purely in this instrumentalist game, and there's no reality touching happening, that's probably fine. Well, I was just using it as like a, is this how he sees the villains? And this is what I was thinking he's doing, the move he's making, is a, is similar to that he's saying, don't do that. That's what I'm asking, I guess. That's what I'm saying, I'm thinking when you're saying, mm -hmm. when you're using these quotes. I'm like, oh, is that like some sort of like, you know, someone has a model and they want to see if it ref like compares favorably to the information we've collected independent of the model. And then, you know, that is sort of the idea of having a mirror that we think is reflecting reality or whatever. That is the move I'm trying to, you're, you're not, you're like giving me nothing. You're just sort of like, nope. So I'm like, I'm just trying to say, it seems to me like there could be more components to it. <clears throat> and you're telling me he's not, he's saying I'm not going far enough. And I'm like, he's not going far enough. Oh no. <clears throat> Maybe I don't know what you're saying. Guys, I, what I'm trying to say is I think he's fine with extrapolating, or whatever the correct term is, the points into the line. Just while you're doing that behavior, don't have any pretensions That's all to just an analogy. reality. Yeah, okay. That whole example is an analogy. It's not an, a, like, when we do this mm -hmm. work for real. Yeah. It's just an analogy to the kind of idea of external validation that it seems to me he is trying to say, or is critiquing, don't do. In the analogy, the dots are the world and the line is the model. Or right. whatever mirror, Yeah. and or, then the dots are the world, yeah, know, yeah. or whatever it is. Then maybe the Rorty point is, there's an indefinite number of lines that you can make given any set of dots, and none of them are epistemically, in the jargon, superior to the others. They're just different, and then you guys can talk to each other about why you made your different lines, and that's it. 
because he's going to do a lot later about that he doesn't even want to go to commensuration. He doesn't even want you all to work on reaching agreement. And that's what I was going to try to get at earlier with the me versus sorority difference. He appears to be anti-agreement even. Mm. He's just like, nope, it's only conversation. And you guys don't have to ever agree. You just do your own thing. You can talk to each other about what you did. But there's no right answer and there's no end to the discussion even. There's no agreement to be found. Am I still misunderstanding the analogy? No. There's an infinite number of different lines and they're just different. I mean, that's all... I mean, I understand what you're saying there. All I'm trying to say is the move it sounds like he was making just a second ago when you were reading from the book sounded to me like he was saying, you know, because I keep thinking like, well, but there's this whole other thing. What is game playing up to? You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's up to a different thing then. An analogy might be the internal validation of your model as to like how do things work together or so, you know, whatever. You know, you don't want to multiply pounds times... Uh, you know, kilograms or whatever, because they're not the same units. You want to keep, you know, what I mean, like it's that. There's that enterprise of internal validation or whatever, and then there's the actual like comparison stuff, which seems more truth-seeking oriented. Not that game playing doesn't do that, just it seems more. Okay, so given the data points and a line, the truth seeker is interested in which of these lines is. Accurate, is real, is yeah. the right one. It's like the physicist who goes, ah, oh, isn't it amazing that this math just really does the job on these physical, you know, patterns or behaviors? It must say something about reality. Yeah. Or whatever. The, that math is, is the, the language of reality. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. It's the language of the universe and all that kind of stuff. So that's the, the move that I think I hear him critiquing from what I'm importing into this conversation. Yes, he does critique that move. Yeah. But then he also critiques... So, that, so that's the truth seeker one. The game player one is, here's my line and here's how I got my line. End of story. Right. Mm -hmm. and the, but then the overseer is the person who says, all right, I received your paper. Everybody send me in your papers. What's all your lines and what's all your papers? It's the professor. And then they're going to grade those lines and say, this line is wrong and here's why, and this is the right answer, and your lines, your, all, all the different class members can be right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, he also wants to get rid of that. So Truth Seeker has mm -hmm. to go, and the professor the overseer has to go, and we all just have to be game players with our different lines and our methodologies to make our lines, and that's it. That's tough, because as human beings, we want feedback. We want to kind of have, you know, like, it sounds to me like he's like, it's fine, just fumble in the dark, fall off a cliff, I don't give a fuck. And, you know, as a, as a person with desires and... Uh, goals and projects and whatever you kind of want to like make headway you want to like you know it's just a natural tendency i think it's almost animal right just or or biological you're just like yeah i gotta just like you know plants like lean towards the sun you know <laughs> like you know they're just like yeah you know and he's all like yeah you can go this way you can bend that way you know but mightn't he say that his suggestion is the best way to achieve your value even because both Truth and professorial overseers end the conversation because both have a right answer. And then what are you going to say? You can whine about it and say, well, I think that your right answer is the wrong, the whatever. And then you have to go be a revolutionary because you just, think the textbook is wrong. Or it's just games within games. But that's another thing entirely, like politics. <laughs> But the best way to keep it going, keep talking, and, ha and make your progress, have your projects, have your conversations, is to remove both of those other points and everybody's just playing, right? I don't know. Let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, what I had just done was attempt to define what epistemology means in the Rorty, and he wants to move from that to hermeneutics. What the fuck is that? Hermeneutics sees the relation between various discourses as those of strands in a possible conversation. Conversation which presupposes no disciplinary matrix which unites the speakers, but where the hope of agreement is never lost so long as the conversation lasts. This hope is not a hope for discovery <laughs> of an antecedently existing common ground, but simply hope for agreement itself or at least exciting and fruitful disagreement. That's all very gameplay to me. Yeah. 
But I don't see why you can't still have some kind of confirmatory thing where the game is to match my line better than you did to these points. And here's how but we the, go about well, what does better it, mean? You know? <clears throat> well, the the rules would be okay. Well, we're going to say that it's you know you're only you, you you fit tighter within these residuals of the you know you have these you know the residuals fit tighter within these points or whatever. And you didn't do that, and I did, and da da da. And I landed my triple point twist or whatever, <laughs> and you kind of like scraped with your you know. You didn't quite do it, and they gave me a nine point eight, and you a nine point five. Mm -hmm. You know that's all. That's game to me. Well, it is to the extent that you realize that the judge's output is arbitrary, and it's just what they decide. What there aren't, yeah, is well criteria that the judges are supposed to use or whatever. But that's where it's games within games, because then that val that criteria that you use to evaluate has its own set of rules. You know, so it's like you fit within that one and it's sort of mushroomed or, you know, umbrellaed out over it and then you have these rules above that. So from the game playing perspective, it's just that. It's just rules within rules. You know what I mean? Games within games. Mm -hmm. So And so the idea is, you know, connect the dots or whatever. Or, you know, whatever it is that one says. You know, it's like when you're out on the pond. You're like, okay, I'm going to skip this rock five times. Or you know whatever it is like kids do when they're like oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and hit that little hole in the tree with this stone and every kid's trying to throw it and they hit the stone it's yeah it's arbitrary in the sense that you've picked out this pattern in the world and you're like I just want to wouldn't it be cool if it went through the hole or whatever mm -hmm. and now everyone's like oh I'll do it you know that kind of thing so it's sort of like just naturally evolves or whatever it just comes out and it's fun <laughs> I don't know what else to but say. <laughs> That situation is always subject to Huck Finn coming along and throwing a rock that misses the hole and declaring that he won. And then the rest of ah, you say, nice. but you didn't put it in the hole, yeah, that's the, the rules, Huck. And he's like, yeah, fuck you, N-word, I don't have to do that. I'm going to, it just works for me. Like, he changes the rules, you know, he's an abnormal discourse participant. And there's nothing to which you and Huck can appeal that ultimately underlies... There's no way for you to compel him to accept your rules. God, no. And we're not going to really include him in the game either. That's what Haunting the Margins, I guess, is all about, is people who aren't included in the game. Yeah. So, I mean, you can... All, if right. you have the social power or whatever to exclude it's like a that, member... It's like that round table. Remember... Uh, that that Dutch TV show, I don't even remember what it was called. It's all over YouTube, and it had Dennett, and had Gould, and Freeman Dyson, and it had uh, Sheldrake, you know, Rupert Sheldrake. And every once in a while, whenever Rupert Sheldrake would play, he'd throw the thing away from the hole, yeah, and they'd all be like, "What the fuck," you know? And he'd take over for a second, but then they'd all like every like Dennett would engage him and be like, well, "Let me see if I understand you correctly," or whatever. And then after a while, they're all just like, whatever. And then they just go, like, they move on, and they would play their little game together. But, okay, we can start with the question, what was there before the Big Bang? Uh, uh, a kind of platonic archetype, or God, or Steve Gould is thinking, am I going all the way to Wilverson just for yeah, answering those yeah, questions? <laughs> yeah. Or not? It's not a question we can take up. Anything you say is largely expressive of a whole set of personal biases that it would take hours on the couch to unravel. And it may well, not even be a well-formed question, which I think was Steve mm -hmm, Kuhlman's mm -hmm. point. That is, can you use the word before in that context? It may be simply an inappropriate use of the word. The question whether it's well-formed or ill-formed is at the moment undecidable. But it's a very profound and important question for science, and it's my own starting point. <laughs> You know, I think of like the peanuts when they all walk together and it's just like a cloud <laughs> or whatever. That's what they were. And then oh, Rupert would be yeah. like, no, 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 kind of walking behind him. Dragging you know? his blanket. Yeah, really exactly. Sad. Yeah. And that's kind of what I, what I picture in a YouTube setting that we can go and watch that you just described where I'm going to throw this and it's going to be like, and yeah, that's a good like, example. Fuck you. I'm not doing that. We're just, we're, we're excited about playing this game, Rupert, mm -hmm. you know? 
And he's not, and that's fine. If he, I think he's been relatively successful at finding people to play with. Just not that group <laughs> who most of them are dead now. Well, yeah, but I mean, he did get invited, and he sat there, and they were all civil, and we so he played. A little. And I think that Rorty <laughs> would be in favor of inviting people like Shell Drake well, and maybe even more yeah. to your round tables. Absolutely. That's part of his point. He's like, D don't have this pretension that you guys who play by a given rule set who are playing your favorite game it's somehow the only game or the best game in town. To or me, whatever. that seems like it could be equally a critique of both truth seeking and game playing. Then, you know, right? He wants an egalitarian game or something where everyone gets to play, and maybe no medals get put out. But <laughs> great, because no one wins. Everyone loses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's another dawdler's trope, right? <laughs> the game was played. Everyone lost. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Because, and I think this talks to this crowd of Gould and his buddies, epistemology sees the hope of agreement as a token of the existence of common ground, which perhaps unbeknownst to the speakers, unites them in a common rationality. For epistemology to be rational is to find the proper set of terms into which all contributions should be translated if agreement is to become possible. Conversation is inquiry. Mm. Epistemology views the participants as united in a group of mutual interests. And again, a lot of that does sound like things that I've said before. I mean, like that's, a lot of that sounds good to me. Yeah. But he already doesn't so much like that. Well, but he still said the buzzword, because I think that's what we called those overseeing, truth-seeking, game-playing, engineering <laughs> modes of inquiry, we call mm -hmm. them. You're right, yeah. He w wants us to instead just to view culture itself as a conversation rather than as some structure. He thinks the line between discourses cannot be rendered commensurable. And those which cannot is how you designate between normal and abnormal discourse. And that's where the whole Kuhnian thing comes in, or whatever, right? So, Shell Drake, in your example, or Huck Finn in the rock throwing example, yeah. are the people who are attempting to do what Kuhn would call abnormal discourse. When you're doing normal science, you have accepted, is it a methodological rule set? And you're like, I'm playing this game. Look what I discovered when I followed a certain strategy within the rules of the game. Absolutely, yeah. The, that was the, like one of the examples that Kuhn used was the X-rays. Sky. Oh, geez, you have like a full beer. I just downed this one. Shit. I'm gonna be all depressed by the end of it because it'll have worn off. But anyway, yes. Uh, Kuhn was definitely about the idea that people are using their instruments. And there are these certain rules. And sometimes someone would be like, ah, something happened. And they'd be like, oh, you must have done something wrong. Right? Because there's this agreement that this is how this all works. Anyway, yes, mm -hmm. I like this tie in. <laughs> yeah, Rory says normal science is as close as real life comes to the epistemologist's notion of what it is to be rational. Everybody agrees on how to evaluate everything everybody else says. Normal discourse is conducted within an agreed-upon set of conventions about what counts as relevant and what counts as having a good argument. So part, I guess, of what I'm what, like my crusades in philosophy are is in setting up a situation like that for what we might call normative, argumentative discourse or something. I want there to be a rule set that we play by. Yes, it is just another game, but then we can meta-argue for our rules being preferable for some reason or other, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sigh. Well, do we? I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that this stays in the game here that we're playing right now with Rorty. But do we? When we go from normal science to revolutionary science, are we resistant to the revolutionary science because a, it means all our efforts towards seeking the truth were wrong, or just you know, is that why people? Is that the motivation or b because the game is over the game's up we got to play this other game and learn these other rules and we were just getting you know what i mean it's like every time i interrupt my son when he's playing video games he gets all pissed off you know because he's like i was just about to shoot that guy in the face <laughs> so like anyway 
That's a whole other thing. I'm sorry. Sort of. There are different ways to end the game. Yeah. Is that what you... One does not want the game to ever end. And one always Mm. wants to feel like they're on the the path of truth. You know? You think even the truth seeker doesn't want the game to end? I mean, then you just become a zealot or whatever. No, that's the truth. They just want to... You find and then you worship the sacred truth. They want to reach the truth. To use a Star Trek analogy, you know, whatever that movie was, was it episode five where they think they've met God or whatever? The idea that like, oh, we've 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 reached the end, you know, finally, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least you're on that course to find out that you might not be on that course at all, and that you were just going after fool's gold, you know, pyrite or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's that kind of like the disappointment. That is so involved in the end of normal science and the beginning of real revolutionary science. And the resistance, I'm thinking, would have to do with that. And that everyone's busy playing the game or seeking the truth. Yeah. Is not is the revolutionary scientist the one who comes along and is like, just goes up to the Nintendo and jerks the cartridge out and says, No more Mario, we're playing Duck Hunt now, and just puts another one in. No. And they're like, but I was playing that game. I was good at that game. I suck at Duck Hunt. I don't want to do that. I think of it more like the um, revolutionary scientist is the one who finds the problem with the game. There are all these things in like Fortnite or whatever. They're hacks or even whatever. Uh, you know, Zelda or whatever it is. But these things become illegal moves by the administrators. And if you're able to access those hacks in the video game in the battle royale that gives you an unfair advantage or it changes things slightly which they don't they want to be able to have the battle royale go as they said it should go you know and so people get automatically booted out when they either accidentally or on purpose use these various hacks which i cannot of course rip off the top of my head right now but there are these ways and I think of a revolutionary science is kind of like that. All of a sudden, there's this like tear in the fabric of your game, and you're like, "Fuck no!" You know, like it's like a hole in the boat, and you're like, "Patch it, patch it!" You know, you spend all this effort trying to patch that yeah. goddamn hole, and you know, really, it's it's uh, the jig is up, and either they have to find a better way, you know, or 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 you know, everyone has to ignore it. And just keep playing as if there wasn't that thing. That's kind of how I was thinking of it. Not someone comes in and rips the thing out. No. Is the problem with that analogy, though, that the objective remained the same? You're still trying to kill everyone else and be the the only person left alive in the battle. Yeah. It's just that you use an unsanctioned method to achieve that. Yeah. So like. But isn't but with revolutionary science, I. Th- feel like it's more like you, you have new objectives, everything like that. But we never know who the game. revolutionary scientist is, right? Yeah. So Rupert Sheldrake, maybe he's the revolutionary scientist, maybe he's not. But he's like, I can explain all this behavior with my crazy thing over mm-hmm. here. And you're like, no, you know, like how is it that a mice acquire some particular behavior set? Well, he's saying there's some sort of telekinetic or whatever. And someone else is saying, no, it's this, you know, natural selection. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? So everyone's playing the natural selection game, and he's like, no, 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 it goes across the waves, or airwaves, or whatever. Yeah. I didn't save the quote, but Rorty mentions that, and I think Kuhn also does, right? Something about how uh, it can only be seen through the lens of history looking back, but the people that fail at revolutionary science are kooks or whatever, yeah. the people that succeed are world historical figures that yeah, change exactly. everything and are geniuses. Right. Exactly. And whether you're a kook or genius, if you're trying to do revolutionary shit, you will never know until after you're dead. This could be the framework of our that I've been looking for for the haunting the margins. Yeah. Yeah, we should totally go to this. <laughs> anyway, sorry. There's an alternative goal value set again. I'm like, oh, I need to figure out how to do the podcast. Well, you know, it's like you always want a gimmick or not a gimmick, but just some kind of fulcrum to leverage. Anyway, uh, this is like getting meta. Or we like pragma. getting meta, don't we? Pragma. More, it's more like pragma because it's about like things that we actually do or whatever, right? Anyway, like the podcast. Mm-hmm. Talking about it's like shop talk on the podcast about the podcast. It's pragma. <laughs> about this, Rorty wrote, uh, "We are the heirs of three hundred years of rhetoric about the importance of distinguishing sharply between science and religion, politics, art, philosophy, and so on." 
it made us what we are today. But that doesn't mean we have to proclaim our loyalty to these distinctions. It's not to say that there are objective and rational standards for adopt, adopting them. We would do well to abandon the notion of certain values, for example, rationality, as floating free of educational and institutional patterns of the day. So that's one of the ways that he's just kind of insulting yeah. the distinctions and traditions of normal science, normal discourse. He's like, well, it's at least what you're used to, <laughs> yeah. but does that mean that it's great? And then he kind of just does a little dot, dot, dot after that. Like, I don't think he so much as argues against that other than to say, give me something more than that's what we've said for a long time and that's what I was taught. Because that's clearly not an argument and the burden's on you. So until you give me more than what's well, what I'm used to, then I'm not going to do it. I would say that's, that's huge. I mean, that's like a big part of everything for... All, a lot of these endeavors because you're just getting it's like a it's an ontogeny you know it's a development you're you're born into some new thing that you're looking into you're you know I don't maybe you're at a you know in an AP class in high school or whatever the fuck it is and then you go to college and you get your bachelor's and you're moving along you found your your major and now you're getting your master's your PhD or whatever it is and you you know like you're moving through these steps and it's like, well, I just, I like this. <laughs> like, whether, yeah. you know, and I'm getting more and more familiar. I'm ma becoming more, I'm increasing my mastery of this game. I enjoy that. It's the, um, it's the whole idea that, you know, there's, again, games within games or objectives within objectives. You're breaking two rocks against each other to get a sharp edge. But you're breaking them to get a better and better types of, type of sharp edge. For all kinds of reasons. Well, this one doesn't cut your fingers as much, you know, or wh whatever it is, you're, you're improving it and you get some kind of satisfaction. There's salience in the action of doing the thing that is satisfying for you, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that's a hard one to break that he's now seeming to call into question. That's his ellipses at the end or whatever, where he's just like, eh. and it's like, oh, you know, I mean, there's a big you know that's what it almost seems to be what it is to be human is to be patterned in this way around the games within games because yeah 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 i want to have a sharp edge and i want to cut the meat and you know cook it or eat it or whatever it is i'm going to do with it but there's an additional thing with my belly's full that i want to have fun with or whatever and there's no leopards wanting to bite my head off right now so this is good you know mm -hmm. And so the fact that he's like calling that into question makes me think, well, what is someone supposed to do now? You know, just wait for the leopard to come and bite off your head or we're passing the time here, Rorty. I mean, yes, that does. Sound, that is a human thing. As Nietzsche would say, all too human. <laughs> and this part reminds me of Nietzsche in that it sounds like what he called the breaking of the tables or the revaluation of all the values. When you're chipping your stone axe, yes, there are ones that are preferable to others, but only based on some system of what you want it to do. And then when you bring in new values, like, well, yeah, I want it to efficiently remove pelts from meat so that I can efficiently extract the tasty bits. What about, the, what about this one? I've now done, I've achieved that same thing, but you also don't cut your hand on it. Like you meant, you know, oh, now, so that's a new value, but it's better. There's, there's variation. You've got Rorty and Nietzsche on one side, and then you've got those people who are literally like living like hunter-gatherers by choice in like Washington State on the other, right? Where they do nothing with technology other than what they can procure from nature or whatever. There's always that variation. It drives me crazy. Because on the one hand, they're saying, hey, what you're doing is not enough. You should abandon X, Y, and Z or whatever. And these other people are like, yeah, you should. But come in my direction. Where we ride horses bareback and like make fucking jackets out of the elk pelts and shit you know like that's what i'm seeing is there's I'm a ton of yeah. variation yeah you're not confused you're, i'm totally you're confused right with by, no um there's always somebody who's like always ready 
There's somebody who's lagging behind, and there's Nietzsche's and Rorities who are ready to move on. And the rest of us are like all in the air, just like trying to play the game. Or, but as I know, understand, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding you or if you're misunderstanding Rorty. Or, of course, I mean, there's other choices. <laughs> but we're dichotomous <laughs> tonight. Um, they don't want you to stop living and making your axes and doing whatever you're doing. They just don't like it when those of you in the tribe who do that add on top of it and this is the, how thou shalt make an axe forevermore. This is how God made it, and this is the right way, and thou shalt always make them this way. They just want to take away the, that big list of things from before. The, that it's true, that it's eternal, that it's rational, that it's essential. Just, as long as you're not making any of those claims, but you're just making an axe, then I don't think they have a problem. Oh, good. All right. Well, they, I was saying that, that we're just making an axe... But that in our human way, we get, we get some kind of enjoyment or we get some kind of stimulation from the process in and of itself. And that's why it's these games within games, right? It's this um, trying to make a, you know, uh, doing something different with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, sharp edge making. And yes, ultimately you're going to use it to cut meat or whatever. But there's this little game within that which is to do better next time or to make it this way or like tonight my son seven years old he'll be turning eight soon he cooked dinner and uh, you know as soon as he sits down and he starts to eat he starts to complain oh we should have done this and should have done that you know like it's always these little bits and pieces that we want to do you know uh you know should add salt at this time or you know like mm -hmm. and that to me seems very human that's not something that i think other organisms necessarily have acquired Probably not. To the same extent that we have. And if Rorty and Nietzsche are like, no, abandon that. You know, it's all too human. Then it's like, wait, 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 wait. You know, like, okay. Well, I don't, but the part about whether you enjoy doing it seems extraneous to this issue. Okay, to me. well then I guess that's fine. Well, then I misunderstood you. Okay. <laughs> all too human. I mean, you I can go like, and enjoy it, but that's... that. I just go to, like, evolutionary psychology or something then. And like, well, yeah, you en enjoy perfecting improving projects and the and creating technologies well that's a sounds like a beneficial adaptation to have so let's make more of the monkeys who like making things sure but i we're not supposed to like evolutionary psychology anymore right that's on the outs well i don't think that's necessarily a psychological thing as much as a i don't even know what that is just behavior i don't fucking know I mean, I, I don't think evolutionary psychology is on the outs. It's just kind of trying to figure out where it's on the ins. That sounded like a joke I didn't get. It's trying to figure out where it's on the ins? I don't know. It's, it's one of those things that, in a way, didn't meet the standards of someone like Gould or whatever it was. And because he was on the in with all these other people, it's sort of haunting the margins in its own right. But it's still got enough people who buy into it that it's not quite living on the edge or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, good, because I kind of like it. All right. Hermeneutics is not another way of knowing slash understanding as opposed to explaining. It is better seen as merely another way of coping. And, again, that kind of becomes a term of art or whatever. I love coping. And that's what the whole axe-making is about, right? It's just coping. I have projects. I have some materials here. I can modify my materials to better accomplish my projects. It's just about how to cope. I like right? it. Yeah. yeah. Coping ranges I are great. And I think part of this happened in previous discussions betwixt you and I about topics similar to this. You seem to push back against the Rorty side of the spectrum in favor of what you perceive to be an alternative side. But it's not an alternative, because you just are so entrenched in the game-playing thing oh. that you either don't know or forget that there really are people as dumb as the people that Rorty needs to argue against. And you're like, oh yeah, I didn't even know I needed to argue against that. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, it's, uh, well, Jesus Christ. I'm just so smart! The difficulty, Rorty writes, stems from a notion shared by Platonists, Kantians, and Positivists that man has an essence. 
namely, to discover essences. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that you're just saying, I never even knew that people thought that, like, what? No. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. No. But lots of people throughout history have thought that, and they need a takedown. And you're just like, in your little science-y game-playing realm, you're like, what? No. What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Yeah, she's having a good time <laughs> over here. Yeah. I mean, I do have a, a problem with people who seem to be very confident and to think that their confidence springs from some actual touching of, you know, reality or whatever. That's frustrating because then it's like, well... How do you explain all these people who do all these different things? You know, well, you're supposed to be partial differential equations. That's the only thing you should use. And it's like, uh, okay, well, there's all these other people who are being very fruitful in their approach using, I don't know, whatever, power laws or some kind of, you know, uh, lab equipment. Uh, and this is just in the realm of science, you know, let alone when we talk about beat poetry or whatever, or any kind of poetry mm -hmm. or what, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but there so that is and it sounds right to me that there is a tradition of people who do basically think that our job the essence of man is to discover essence of other things you know but those sure. who are anti-essentialist in the first place don't have to worry about it and then that's great because right. that's what we wanted in the first place yeah I mean I would say that one wants understanding which is just like, you know, making improvements on your hand axe or whatever the fuck it is. You're just making improvements on what you think you could do differently next time that you'd be satisfied with. Or more satisfied with. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So where, I think this, where he goes, or a parallel path or something, to the normal abnormal, to the epistemology v. hermeneutics thing, is what he calls edifying philosophy versus systematic philosophy. And so the systematic is on the side of the epistemology and the descartes locke Kant tradition and the whatever, and the normal science that we have an agreed-upon set of rules, typically rationally derived, armchair discovered, you know, <laughs> that our job is to just work within but that he wants us to move out of that systematic stuff into what he calls edification, which is what? I shall use edification to stand for the project of finding new, better, more interesting, more fruitful ways of speaking. A poetic activity of thinking up new aims, new words, new disciplines, followed by, so to speak, the attempt to reinterpret our familiar surroundings in the unfamiliar terms of our new inventions. It is supposed to be abnormal to take us out of our old selves by the power of strangeness <laughs> to okay. aid us in becoming new beings. So that's this edifice that this is building and he wants to promote more construction. Well, now shall I even say construction because that sounds systematic almost. But that he wants to, you know, do, engage Sculpting? in this poetic, yeah, maybe sculpt it rather than s construct. That might be better. Yeah. The other people he's saying is in this Pla Platonic Aristotelian view that the only way to be edified is to know what is out there, to reflect the facts. But that this is, oh, and he loops in another person to the good team that, you, that you'll be happy to see join the party. Oh. Jean-Paul Sartre. Oh. And the existentialist attitude of saying the attempt to gain objective knowledge of the world is an attempt to avoid the responsibility for choosing your own projects, which I really like, because <laughs> I think that's most of what people are doing most of the time is avoiding responsibility. Yes. And if you think that the name of the game is, well, there's an objective world out there, parentheses, constructed by God, little g, whatever, it can be Sean Carroll's God, I don't care. But you think there's an objective world out there and that you, your essence, your being, your job, your project is to bring that into the mirror of your mind, which almost all people, I think, think, including scientists, then you're playing the wrong game. You're doing the wrong thing. You're avoiding responsibility and you're not being very poetic. 
Systematic philosophy is like the search for universal commensuration in one final vocabulary. He doesn't want to do that. You gonna say something? Nope. <laughs> I'm making sweet, sweet, delicious cuddles with Knox. Delicious! Knox, you interrupted Rorty. The point of edifying philosophy, though, is just to keep the conversation going rather than to find objective truth. Does he really say Does that? That sound good? Yeah. That, that's a oh, that's totally yeah. game playing, right? Yeah. That's why I'm saying he's collapsing all the everything yeah. into just game playing. Yes. Because that's the goal, is just to keep conversation going. Just keep, keep working. And that's what, in a sense, we're going to do anyway. Right? Well, yeah, Unless I mean, we somehow bring about... Well, as you and I would imagine, as enemy skeptics, we'll have to like accept that that's all we really can do. Yeah. Well, it's either that or stop conversing, and that doesn't sound very good. Well, we're in a quarantine. <laughs> and we ain't stopping. Oh, delicious looks. I saw something, a tweet, where someone was like, I miss people. I was like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, naughty. I would miss doggies, though, wouldn't I? So this all very much reminds me of that <clears throat> that um, philosopher or scholar of religion, and he had a similar kind of thing where he's like finite and infinite games book. The idea that there is, you know, really it's the infinite game that we all want. We don't want finite games because finite games mean there's all this hard structure and... You know, we win, we find the truth, and all that kind of stuff, and it validates our existence yeah, and responsibility right. and all that crap. And really, it, the whole point is to just keep playing, you know? Yeah, the Rorty sounds like he would be totally with Karst. Right? Yes, David P. Karst. James. <laughs> James, James P. Karst. Karst. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that he's promoting making the game infinite. Yeah. And that if you're going to be a normal discourse member... You're playing a finite, potentially finite game. Yeah. Maybe they're not all, but... Uh, Revolutionary but the, science continues the game. Right, that makes it infinite for sure. Yeah. I'm just saying, maybe there are infinite normal games too, but we know for sure if you play a revolutionary, or allow the revolutionaries in your game, right. that's infinite, definitely. Yes. So why should we do this? How? What's the argument, or what's the thing? If you want us to move from... Normal to abnormal, systematic to edifying. What's the problem, right? And you're like, oh wait, it's not over. No, <laughs> I, I thought mean, we I were done. Like, well, <laughs> shit. What kind of answer is the right answer for someone like Rorty, right? He doesn't necessarily require Harlandonian arguments, though, right? He does not require arguments, does he? No. In fact, I might not even like, like them. I could say like, oh, you know, like. Without art, there is no life, or whatever. Something like that. Like, to continue to live. Yeah, without arguments, Ooh. why bother? Yes, delicious. <laughs> Sorry. They're Sorry, going to be like, what does he keep calling I'm delicious? <laughs> it's Knox. He's so cute. He's totally making the cover of this one. And Knox is a dog. He's a doggy. Anyway. The aim of this book. <laughs> we arrive at one hour, 15 minutes in. Okay is to undermine the reader's confidence in the mind as something that one should have a philosophical view about, in knowledge about something in which there ought to be a theory that has foundations, and in philosophy as it has been conceived in the LDK tradition, or the D whatever. Sure. The and so that if he can accomplish those things that that's what's going to be the motivation to become abnormal. So he's got to get rid of the, the mind, which we've done in multiple episodes. Oh. And, be gone! And in the pretensions of epistemology and this traditional philosophy thing. Rorty is not an ironic kind of fellow, though. No, he's ironic kind of fellow. Oh, God. Ironism. Oh, that's her title. An ironic kind of fellow or whatever, right? <laughs> yes, it is. There's lots of possible... No, there's topics. one. There's just one, Highland. Only one truth. Have you learned nothing? <laughs> it's very distracting around here, folks. <laughs> it is.
But it's a sausage. It's like, you know, there's a little, he's got this tail, which is like a sausage, and then he's a sausage. It's like games within games. Sausages within sausages. The things people <laughs> care about. I'm like, nobody cares about that. And then Ryan's like, yeah, nobody cares about fucking what Rorty had to say either. Yeah, no, that's true. But then that means it kind of proves his point. <laughs> Go to bed, Liam. We're so off the rails. Valley